I often struggle with sleep paralysis when I'm stressed out with school or my anxiety is really terrible at the time. For context around the time of this dream, I was 13. I had just gotten out of an abusive relationship which put a lot of stress on me. I was terrified my ex would try to come after me like he often threatened to do if I ever broke up with him. He was held back multiple times and lied about his age to make it easier for him to groom me. He was 16 years old which still makes me sick. I know it might not seem like that big of a deal, but me being 13 at the time, three years was a big age gap. He knew my home address and he had many firearms. The entire relationship was abusive and overall toxic. I was in constant fear of my safety. Luckily, that didn't last much longer. He stopped trying to reach out to me and stopped stalking me on social media. I guess the message finally got through to him that I was never coming back. It was roughly five weeks after I broke up with him that the sleep paralysis started to happen. At first, it was just me being unable to move, and it was relatively hard to breathe, which was still terrifying, but definitely not as horrifying as the sleep paralysis that I would have about a week later. I never liked being in my room alone, period. But recently, I got increasingly more uncomfortable being in there by myself. I started to hear little things like tiny knocks or taps along my walls and windows, even inside my closet. My closet, of course, is the only room that has an access panel to the crawl space in the ceiling, which made me even more uncomfortable sleeping in there. I constantly had a feeling of being watched while inside my room, particularly in the closet. A couple of times I swore that I saw a man or a humanoid figure race across the opening of the closet door. I would always run and tell my parents what I saw, but they would always tell me the same thing. I think you've been watching way too many scary videos, or maybe you shouldn't be staying up so late, your mind is probably playing tricks on you. Which sure, I guess they could be right, but nothing changes the fact of the strange and horrifying dream that I had later. I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night. I quickly realized I was in another sleep paralysis episode when I groggily attempted to look around my room. My body was completely stiff as a board, and I was unable to move anything beside my eyes. Usually, I'm a very hard sleeper. I never wake up in the middle of the night, but I knew something had to have woken me up in my sleep. I tried to look around the room a little more. I always had a fan pointing at me while I slept, but tonight, it was turned off. I swear I turned it on before I crawled into bed that night. I thought maybe I just forgot to do it since I was really tired. As I was contemplating if I really had plugged it in, I noticed that the door to my closet was slightly open. Now, I know I hadn't opened up that door before I went to bed, just because of how scared I was of it. My heart began to race. I could even hear it. My eyes darted around the room, trying to look for anything that might have been in there. When I started smelling something terrifyingly familiar, it was the cologne of my ex-boyfriend that he constantly wore. But something was off. It was almost as if the smell of the cologne was mixed with the smell of a dead animal. My heart was in my throat and I started to cry. I thought my worst fear had finally come true. My psychotic ex-boyfriend finally made it into my house. As I was hyperventilating and crying, I heard a small thud in the corner of my room. I held in my tears and gathered the courage to look in the direction of that sound. My eyes started to focus on the darkness in that corner when I started to make out a tall, shadowy figure, hunched over. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I began hyperventilating even more, trying to at least move some part of my body to reach my phone. It looked as if the figure was turning back toward me, facing the corner. I tried to scream again, and a small audible gasp came out of me. The figure turned slowly to face me. It was hunched over and draped in a dark cloth. Its back was bony and stuck through the thin drape. Its hands were nothing but skin and bone. Its nails, or more like claws, were longer than the fingers themselves. I tried to focus even more as my eyes felt like they were being permanently opened wide. I made out more features of this terrifying creature and noticed that it didn't have a face. And that's what terrified me the most. It didn't have a face. I was practically sobbing as this creature made its way over to me. I noticed the horrible mixed smell of death and my ex-boyfriend 
getting stronger as it got closer. The smell almost became too much for me to bear, as I felt like I might scream and vomit at the same time. The creature started to climb up onto my bed and straddle me. I sobbed even more. It reached out its bony hand and put it around my throat. This is something my ex-boyfriend always did to scare me, and once he even tried to strangle me in the school library with just his bare hands. The creature's hand tightened around my throat, and I could feel it as he was actually doing it. I could feel everything happening to me. Suddenly, it started to speak in some extremely low and monotone language that I couldn't quite understand. It almost sounded like an imitation of English, like how someone might sound if they only heard the English language a couple of times. The room got extremely cold, to the point that I could see my own breath. I felt as if I might pass out when suddenly, the creature stopped. It stood up off my bed and walked into my closet and shut the door, like nothing ever happened. I was finally able to move again and immediately check my phone for the first time. It was 2.45 a.m. I leapt out of my bed, still hyperventilating and sobbing, and ran to tell my parents. I threw open the door and woke them up. They were furious with me, but when they saw that I was crying, they immediately became concerned. My dad asked me what happened, and I told him the story. He started to calm down and do his old lines again saying that I was just imagining something. But he looked down at my neck and saw the large abrasions and marks from that creature's hand. He quickly became concerned again, grabbed his gun, and ran into my room. He threw open the closet door, but obviously there was nothing there, and the fan was turned on like I always had it. My dad turned to me, said I must have still imagined it, but he refused to talk about it afterwards. I knew he was a little creeped out and terrified, just like I was, and I knew he now believed me. A little bit after that dream happened, my dad went back into my room and started complaining about the smell. He smelled the same thing that I did. I didn't elaborate because I was afraid he would tell me the same thing that he always did. I'm imagining it. But the fact that he smelled it too confirmed that it wasn't just a dream. I've never been a believer in the paranormal, but I believe this might have been an encounter with an actual demonic entity of some kind. Whatever it was, it used the distinct smell of my ex-boyfriend and one method of his abuse to scare me. I haven't had another sleep paralysis dream since, and I hope I never do. I'm sitting on my bed right now, writing this, and I still have that feeling like I'm being watched. This isn't my actual story, but a story that my grandmother told me about one of her aunts back many years ago. The story will be a little difficult for me to tell, as my grandmother came to America as a refugee and an immigrant. Even for me, there is a bit of a language and cultural barrier. I've always been intrigued by this tale and thought I would take the opportunity to share it with you all. My grandmother and much of my family comes from Laos. This is a small, narrow country in the southeast mainland of Asia. During the Vietnam War, there is a secondary conflict going on in my home country called the Secret War. The CIA wanted to break up all the support for the Vietnamese fighters, including supply lines, which they believed tracked right across the border of Laos. The Secret War started with just simply boots on the ground. Select military units chosen to run top secret operations in each village or town. Grandma said that it was mostly policing. American soldiers were looking for weapon caches, supply depots, anything that might help the Vietnamese cause. As the conquest took place, my grandmother's aunt began talking with an American soldier who would frequent on the outskirts of the village. Their exchanges turned romantic, and soon the soldier was learning to speak the traditional Hmong. They shared gifts, held hands, and ultimately, held a vision of a future. The aunt, who I'll call Anna, became smitten over time with this charming mystery army man. One week, he failed to return though, and Anna was devastated. Usually when a person vanishes from the area, regardless of nationality, it was usually due to the war. 
People were dying in the trees around the village every day, as they could hear the gunfire battles across more distant hills where forces clash along the border. Still, my aunt held out hope that he was alive and would wait for the American every day along the outskirts of the village. Over time, the secret war ramped up into what was essentially non-stop bombings of the jungle and villages. Nowhere was safe for my grandma, and it wasn't uncommon to see women running at full sprint through the trees, clutching a baby to their chest, trying to escape the blast zones. The descriptions that she gave of these scenes were haunting. I could tell by just the way she spoke. Those caught in the crossfire would quickly learn something, though. There was no escaping the blast zone. The tactics employed by the American military are what we now know as carpet bombings. Planes would roll by every hour, offload whole cargo supplies of missiles, which raised massive swaths of the country and wildland. The CIA was convinced there were tunnels as well as supply caches and sought to destroy them rather than just monitor them. When things got this bad, the villagers of Laos had very few options for survival. They didn't know anything about the tunnels, but there were caves, whole networks of them laid into the hills and mountains. This was the only place people could hide from certain death. The people got an idea of the bombing schedules and the amount of time between hearing the first engine and the first explosion on the ground. This allowed them to build a loose timetable of safety. They could leave the caves for perhaps a few hours at a time to forage and evacuate their belongings from the village. It was never long though, before everyone went scurrying back into the dark, rocky pockets of the earth. Regardless of the schedules, no one ever left the caves at night. Too many soldiers prowling in the jungle, and the bomber planes came too consistently in the dark too. War is made when no one can see it coming. One week came and brought the most terror yet. The ground didn't stop shaking for five days, or at least so my grandmother said. The firefights in the jungle were getting closer, heavier, less dead air between the reports. Sometimes it wouldn't stop for hours, and the only thing they could hear in between were the screams of the wounded and dying. They crawled into the cave that night and went far back, where the air was clean and heavy in the great stone chambers. They used lanterns and candles to light up some of the walkways, or places where they had to crawl. These places were mostly near the entrance of the cave, so as one would progress deeper, they found the chasm growing darker and darker. It also meant my grandma and our family could see the shadow of people approaching. My grandma said it was very late, everyone else was sleeping, when she heard something echo through the chasm and up into the chamber. Her eyes shot open, and she watched the flickering light that illuminated the cave entrance, maybe thirty below her at a gentle slope. Nothing disturbed the glow, but the sound continued. It was footsteps, or something similar to it. There were twenty or thirty villagers sleeping in this particular area of the cave, piled together for warmth and security in the unexplored darkness. My grandma didn't bother to wake anyone up because she assumed whatever the shambling or scraping sound was would surely do it. But no one ever stirred. She waited alone, petrified in fear. Then she heard a voice, muttering from somewhere unseen. Grandma couldn't make out the words at first, but soon it was close enough to place. It was a familiar, odd voice of an American. It was the soldier that Anna loved, mumbling in woefully broken Hmong. He was saying, I'm back for you, over and over again. The strange part was, each time he said it, he spoke it in a different tone of voice. The first time it sounded sad, and then happy, then excited, and scared, and so on. It sounded like an American, or whoever it was, was practicing their speech while navigating the chasm. Sometimes there would even be laughing in between the words, or chattering, whatever strange sound he'd be making in the dark. Grandma grew terrified as the voice approached, and did the only thing her young mind would ever allow, close her eyes go still and just wait. It was too late to wake everyone up now, or even so, what would they do in the face of an American soldier? There weren't weapons in the cave for protection, as most of those hiding were women and children. Something came shambling out of the tunnel up the rock face, 
something far larger than a man. Its massive silhouette blocked out any whisper of the light that emanated from the chasm and seemed to grow taller and wider with each step. My grandma watched it from behind her eyelashes, but once it was within a few feet, she could hear it breathing. She closed her eyes for real this time and prayed for anything but death. It touched her then. A big heavy hand came down and rested on her shoulder for a moment, as if the visitor was kneeling down to rest. She then felt that great hand slowly slide down her arm until it stopped atop her own hand, and when it did, she could feel the details for what they were. It wasn't a hand though, but a huge furry paw, like that of a cat. It had the soft pads between the tufts of hair and retract claws that came up to a razor tip. Before she could react, someone else stirred in the darkness. It was Aunt Anna, who quickly but silently had climbed to her feet. Grandma heard an exchange of words then, between Anna and the creature. Then they both moved toward the tunnel and the exit of the cave system. The thing that spoke with a soldier's voice led them, and Anna followed along just a few steps behind. My grandma watched in confused horror as her aunt disappeared through the cave hollows. Here's the reality though. No one ever saw Aunt Anna again. This was a big incident for my family living in Laos as one of our own vanished in the middle of the night when everyone else was safe and accounted for in the caves. Sympathy and assistance in searching was non-existent due to the war, and Anna was swept away in the pile of assumed casualties just like all the others. My grandma, for whatever reason, seemed to enjoy telling this story. I think she struggled with carrying that guilt for a long time, especially since she was the last person to see Anna alive and may have been able to save her, so she made sure to tell that story regularly as a kind of an honor for her passing. I think it also served as a neat little nugget of culture for us grandkids, who escaped the turmoil that our elders had to endure. I don't know what that creature was that came into that cave, but it seemed like it wanted to be human, or maybe even had been at one time. When I was in high school, I dated this girl my junior and senior year. After that crashed and burned, I was absolutely desperate to get out of my hometown and onto something new. My older sister at the time lived in Oklahoma City, thought she could get me a job, so I took the plunge. Within a week of graduating high school, I packed up everything that I owned, moved over a thousand miles away to a city that I'd never even been to. It wasn't a huge culture shock or anything like that, but there was some stuff to get used to. First off, the job that I had lined up for me started at 5 in the morning, but very quickly I had to learn a whole new sleep schedule, which involved going to bed at a decent hour and waking up around 4 o'clock in the morning. The place that I worked was at a factory near the Air Force Base, so the entire commute was mostly on the edge of town. I'd weave through a few sparse neighborhoods, but a lot of it was just rolling fields of tall grass. Every single day, I would pass this creepy abandoned building that was more isolated than the other properties on this stretch of road. In the mornings, it would loom as a staunch black phantom out amongst the trees. It looked like a hole punched right through the fabric of reality, like something darker than dark, if that makes any sense. Honestly, I didn't give it much more thought, as this was just a commute drive for me, and by the time I'd pass it in the afternoon around 2 p.m. on my way home, the sun would expose it as a ratty old brick and mortar building like much of what you would see in Oklahoma. It was abandoned, somewhat vandalized, and a pretty good size. After a year of driving by it every day, I came up with the notion that it used to be a school, or maybe even some kind of office building. While living in Oklahoma City, I met a guy named Stefan, who worked at a movie rental place near where I lived. Since I was new in town, I found myself watching a lot of rented movies on the weekends, and naturally, Stefan was my first friend living out here. He was a tall, handsome, and reclusive guy who daydreamed about working as a mortician and was even going through the motions to become a certified embalmer for a local mortuary. As you can imagine, Stefan had some peculiar interests. He was always pulling little practical jokes on me, like pretending he had a pocket full of loose cadaver teeth, that kind of thing. He loved horror movies, scary movies, rumors, 
anything that got the heart pumping. Now, Oklahoma isn't the oldest or most cultured place in America, but there is an odd amount of allegedly haunted stuff across the state. Stefan liked to investigate whatever he could find, mostly random stuff that we'd overhear about around town or from folks in the video store. Sometimes he'd just find stuff online. Whatever the case, at least once, maybe twice a month, he'd drag me along on some kind of adventure, usually in the middle of the night, and usually to find a ghost or a monster of some kind. Well, there was one day that I got home from work, and Stefan was already there waiting for me. He had a foot kicked out of his window as he smoked a cigarette in the unforgiving Oklahoma humidity. When I came rolling into the driveway, he sprang to his feet and rushed right over, already gabbing at my window that wasn't even rolled down yet. Whatever was going on, it had Stefan excited. Dude, there's this place we gotta go look at, he says as I get out of my car. What is it? I asked. I don't know, but I always wanted to go look at it. It's just up the road, came his response. I went inside, changed my clothes, and we hit the road. This was pretty unusual, as we did most of our ghost hunting at night. A lot of these places were condemned or on private property, so it required a certain amount of sneakiness. I really didn't know what to expect with the hour being so early. The drive was all too familiar to me. Stefan and I sucked down a couple of clove cigarettes, the snap crackly ones all the hipsters used to smoke back in the day. It was the same drive that I made to work, albeit a little modified. I was stunned when we rolled up to the old brick building on that isolated property, the one I drove past every single day. Damn, really? I said. I know this place. I drive by it all the time. Me too, Stefan confessed, and I've always wanted to see what it is. Well, why are we doing this now, in the middle of the day? I asked. Stefan simply brought up a hand and pointed to a sign hanging near the driveway entrance. It was a real estate sign, and the main phrase very clearly read, or sale, in big red letters. It was all kind of genius, because of the sign, we could roll onto the property and actually look around under the guise of being investors. We didn't have to snoop around in the dark with flashlights and pocket knives, and maybe put ourselves in real danger. Little did we know, we'd be in danger either way. We parked and just played it cool, actually took the time to get into character. We'd done a lot of breaking and entering, but not a lot of lying to gain entrance. We were both pretty young and driving a Toyota Matrix, not dressed like we had millions of dollars in our bank accounts either. If anyone came up to us and wanted credentials, I knew we'd really have to sell them a story to stay on that property. As we came up with our little lie in the car, we looked around and much to our delight, we saw there weren't any other cars around. The place was completely empty, save for us and that for sale sign. We got out and walked around the front yard first. I also figured and assumed it wasn't out of the realm of possibility for the place to be under 24 hour camera surveillance. It was a complete dump, but it was a huge facility. It would make for a great hobo hotel. Either way, we walked onto the lawn, commented on the trees and spotted zero cameras. It was finally time to take a look. For whatever reason, I felt really caught up in whatever mystery was at hand. Looking back, I think it was just because I was a transplant. I wasn't from there or anything, but still, a place that I had come to know on my own had really been in the back of a true blue local kid's mind like Stefan. We walked up to what I perceived to be the front of the building, which was just a massive broadside of brick. There were narrow windows at the very top, big wide ones at the ground floor, and then narrow windows again along the ground level, which peered down into the basement. Almost every single one of these was smashed out allowing a brief glance into the twisted shadows waiting for us within. We walked up to the ground level windows and crouched low to peer inside. The only way I can describe the state of the basement interior was as if a tornado had somehow passed through it. It was beyond destroyed, beyond gutted. It was something out of a World War II movie. The concrete along the walls and floors was shattered, paint and dirt splattered everywhere, evidence of a fire in one corner and all the manner of furniture smashed into splinters. Anything that was once drywall or insulation was now reduced to dust and mold. Amongst the wreckage, though, there was a single wooden chair sitting upright, facing toward us. Tied to the back support was a single white balloon, 
free-floating a foot or two in the air. It was full of helium, like a real party balloon, and it creeped us out to no end, but also kind of satisfied us a bit. The place was definitely going to be weird. It only took me a minute to realize this broad side of the building didn't have a door, so it couldn't really be the front. We walked around to face the east side and came upon a staircase that led to a great opening with hinges on both sides, but no doors. Someone or something had blown the double doors open wide so anything could come and go. An old dying tree stretched over the entrance arch and beneath its scraggly limbs, we made out the name of the facility, St. Vincent's Home for Boys. It was written in faded block letters with a black accent bar around it. We were both kind of caught off guard, but hey, the place had a for sale sign, so we would have to be at least somewhat official. When we ascended the stairs, we found that it led into a long hallway, but there was a staircase landing. Then there was a small desk pushed up against the far wall. The top was covered with two or three inches of multicolored wax, which also ran down the legs to pull upon the floor. There were wicks and scorch marks on the top, so it became apparent that someone had burned candles, if not dozens of candles, atop that table, until they melted down and coated that entire thing. On the wall behind the table were some words that were painted, but the only ones that I remember said, we all die. I think the rest may have been in Latin. This place was a complete creep show, top to bottom. We went down the hall and found all kinds of creepy stuff on the walls, and eventually some old clothes and briefcases scattered throughout some of the rooms, which were all kind of identical. It was like an old-timey hotel or something. The clothes had discarded items that were all seriously dated, like it was the same stuff from whenever the place had just been abandoned. I found a desk with a drawer that was sealed, so I lifted it up and jimmied the thing open. Inside, I found some medical records that were 70 years old. Names, social security numbers. It was unbelievable to see so much delicate information, completely forgotten in a box somewhere. The top floor was almost a time capsule, short of all the scary threats and ominous messages painted upon the walls. We found the stairs, which were dark, steep, and made of the same crumbling concrete. About halfway down, we found the first piece of a doll, and you know the kind. Thick, bendy rubber comes apart if you pulled hard enough. The basement must have had thousands of them down there in various states of disassembly. Some were still intact, with crazy faces colored upon them, hair cut into psycho little styles, and half of them were splattered with red paint. It was the weirdest thing, and Stefan and I were kind of there for it. This place had everything our weird hearts desired. As we were coming down the stairs, though, we heard something strange down in the basement, like a metal door clanging closed. We looked around, but we didn't see anyone, nor did we find a metal door of any kind. There were a lot of metal desks with drawers, but they all seemed too bent and warped to be able to close quickly like that. We even found a safe in one room that had yet to be opened. We were actually shocked that no one pried it out of the floor and taken it yet. It wasn't really that big, but maybe the size of an end table. You could get it out of there with a couple of crowbars and a dolly. There was more creepy stuff painted on the walls, some of which I followed around to the back. Stefan lingered up in the front, where we saw that chair and the balloon, as he was fascinated with why it was down there. More candles had been burnt in a circle around that seat. I eventually stepped into a big bathroom, complete with a couple of tile showers and multiple toilets. It was like a small gym bathroom from the 1950s, with little checkered tile and drain built right into the floor. By the sinks, I saw some old rusted out medicine cabinets, most of which had been shattered to fragments. I walked up to them and moved one of them back and forth. It seemed to still have some good rotation on it. Something occurred to me then, and I slammed the metal frame of the cabinet and perfectly recreated that slamming that we heard earlier. Mystery solved. I went back and found Stefan, who was wide-eyed and ready to bolt back upstairs. I explained to him what I found, led him to the bathroom, and showed him everything. From there, we only discovered more rooms, more creepy odds and ends in the dark. There was all kinds of evidence of weird seances, rituals, whatever the hell they were all up to. Stefan had told me about different cults and devil worshippers that he'd looked up online that allegedly had been in the area at the time. 
we started exploring some of the bedroom units on the back side. And that's when we heard the scariest thing. A man coughing. And not even really coughing, but like trying to clear his throat or something. We stopped and listened again. It sounded like it was coming from out of the walls around us. It would cough, clear its throat, but then turn to gasping and other guttural sounds just like it. It would get louder and louder until we were forced to book it back the way we came, and out into the sunlight. The basement was beyond black, like we'd step into another world down there. I swear the last thing I heard before climbing back to the first floor was that choking and gasping sound, and then it turned into laughter for just a split second. Stefan didn't hear it, but he was also ahead of me trying to get out of the basement with a quickness. He sought the stuff out, but was a bit of a turncoat the moment anything got too dicey. As we climbed the stairs, there was a tremendous banging coming from the concrete behind us. It sounded like the medicine cabinet clatter, but multiplied by a thousand. It felt like that whole building was shaking, all through a deafening metallic sound. To this day, we both have no idea what that could have been. Topside, nothing had really changed. No cops, no real estate agents, no property owner. We were still free to look around and explore. After poking around the last few rooms and snapping a couple of pictures, we hopped back in Stefan's car and went back to my place to debrief and talk about what the hell had just happened. The first thing that I wanted to do was some research. St. Vincent's Home for Boys was all that was running through my mind, and let me tell you, it's going to simmer in yours for a while too. We figured we'd find some history of failed business, but much to our surprise, St. Vincent's was originally opened in the 1940s as a mental asylum. Its operators were a group of Catholic rehabilitators known as the Brothers of Mercy, but very little of that was found there. Allegations of physical, mental, and sexual abuse came from patients between the ages of 9 and 90 years old against multiple male nurse staff of that asylum. Soon allegations of murder began to surface. One nurse actually confessed to suffocating two different patients, simply to see what it was like. While this was all happening, St. Vincent's was constantly expanding, adding more rooms to house more patients. Throughout all of this, the Brothers of Mercy only helped and hired male staff and patients. The facility, after that nurse's confession to murder, eventually transitioned into the hands of Richard Dolan, who was a priest and rehab consultant as well. He wanted to remodel it into an all-male drug and alcohol clinic, where patients could live on site and receive both prayer and treatment from Dolan, work various jobs around the property in exchange for room and board. The all-male aspect was interesting because Dolan didn't keep it out of respect for the previous administrators. Father Dolan had been arrested for soliciting sex from a male undercover officer in the downtown district. It was also rumored to hire men from the flea market on 10th and Penn to do odd favors for him on his day off. Dolan would operate St. Vincent's for only a few years, to which he changed the name to the main artery. His plans were to further develop the property, but that never came to fruition as Dolan was found beaten to death in his apartment in 1988. His murder remains unsolved to this day. Friends of his claimed that the priest had been attacked by a various stranger in the days leading up to the murder. Stefan and I gleamed all of this from an hour of scrolling on Google back at my place. We were both absolutely floored. The craziest part was that there was a semi-famous local ghost hunting team who had visited the facility within the last couple of years had a lengthy breakdown of it on their website. We got to watch them in the videos, exploring the exact same halls. They even had some kind of EVP recording, a musty deep male voice saying things like leave or help. It was some of the most unsettling stuff that I've ever heard, and honestly brought me to tears when I heard it and read about it. I couldn't believe I had just been traipsing through a place where people had literally been murdered for fun. All those crazy sounds we heard, suddenly made sense in a sickening way. Finding the truth online that night was mind-blowing, and not in a good way. Hell, even my commute to work was a dread every day after that. Not just seeing, but knowing what went on in there. I had no idea I'd been driving by one of the most haunted buildings in the entire state of Oklahoma. St. Vincent's Home for Boys is still standing to this day, and remains for sale for any of you who might be interested.
I lived in a haunted house as a kid throughout the 1990s, but nothing at all malevolent really happened, thankfully. The activity was overall what I would describe as scare tactics, but there was one potentially violent instance that shook me really well. The house itself was built in 1949, and it arguably had some creepy vibes to it and the surrounding property, but the focus of the story is the attic. The house was a square colonial style building on about an acre of property. The street side and right side were all lined with tall evergreen trees so that it was obscured from the road. There were two gravel driveways on the right side of those trees that led to two houses behind ours that were much newer and at some point the old property had been sold and subdivided. And the left side had a thin strip of wood and an old stone wall that separated us from that neighbor. The woods then expanded into a large state forest that encompassed basically every house on the road. There was also a large detached two bay garage that was on the left side, along with our driveway. These bays ran deep and could easily fit four cars, and there was a finished back room to the garage that was very creepy. Specifically, there was this large black burlap material covering the entire inside of the door that led to the backyard but it had what could be described as what looked like a chalk outline of a very tall person woven into the burlap. That part always bugged me out as a kid, especially when I went in there for my outside toys and whatnot, but nothing ever happened in the garage. The attic itself was a walk-up attic with a full set of stairs in the middle, that split into the left and the right fully finished sections. If I had to guess, it had been completed in the 1970s, as they had used this puke green cut pile carpeting and installed fake wood panels that cordoned off the finished sections from the storage sections of the attic. In front of you, at the top landing, as well as directly above the door at the base of the stairs, are removable panels on the walls that led to the sloped portions of the attic roof line, which were used as storage crawl spaces. The left of the stairs had this waist-high retaining wall shelf, while the right side of the stairs had a full wall which had this modest closet accessible from the right side of the attic, which also had a small removable access panel for something in it. My dad used the left half of the attic for his collectibles and stuff, while I had free reign of the right half as my hangout spot once I hit middle school in the late 1990s. I spent a lot of time up there playing video games, building Legos, and reading books. I had two chairs, a couch, a table. I could pick up basic TV signals and had whatever video game system of mine that I wanted at the time hooked up. It was almost like I had my own apartment up there. Now that the context of the attic layout is taken care of, the important bits to these occurrences are three removable wall panels. These things weren't just loosely put in place. They did take deliberate effort to remove, and I think you know where I'm going with this. Often while I was hanging out up there, at least the panel of the landing up top would pop out of its place in the wall, with enough energy to leisurely slide down the stairs and crash into the door at the bottom. The panels are like three foot-ish tall and would have at least that link between the last step and the wall. If it was the one above the door, well, that one required even less to make a ruckus because there was only like an eight to 10 inch ledge that you had to use to access it. So that panel fell straight down to the 10 foot bottom of the stairs. I remember that ledge being the width of a VHS tape. This was a common version of the events, nothing too crazy but a little annoying having to put the panels back on the wall periodically. One time in particular though, I was sitting in the chair closest to the wall, blocking off my view of the stairs on the side of the attic. I was playing PS1 for a long gaming session. I'd paused the game and got up to, I assume, use the bathroom on the second floor. I make my way towards the stairs, but only a few steps. And then all of a sudden, both of the panels at either side of the stairway simultaneously fly off the wall with extreme force and collide in midair, then crash to the bottom of the stairs. I ran scared shitless downstairs and didn't go back up for at least a few hours. And when I say extreme force, I mean explosive force, like every panel flew at least 15 feet and would have definitely hurt someone if they were in that path. It was almost like the Hulk himself punched each panel off of the wall that they were seated into. And no, it wasn't a draft thing or a stormy weather thing. It happened pretty much in conditions that the house didn't have any kind of problems. I recall one of the less explosive events where I picked up the panel from the bottom of the stairs. I put it snug back into the wall, then turned around and took a few steps back to my area, and it did the same thing. 
I straight up said aloud, All right, I'm leaving. I packed it up and did something else somewhere in the house. I had at least two of my friends experience this phenomena on a few occasions, as well as my younger brother of three years. In fact, one of those instances, my friend C and I had locked my brother up there during one of the more eventful panel situations. We were kind of assholes back then. He was screaming to be let out of the attic, and he was so scared. Now that I think about it, that hook and loop lock on the outside of the attic door had been there ever since we moved in, and it was the only door in the house to have one. Additionally, when I was much younger, I recall hearing those panels crashing into the door at odd hours of the night, but it was far, far less frequent then, until I started spending a significant amount of time up there. Most of these events would have taken place during middle school in the late 90s, when I was allowed to take over that spot. We moved when I was entering into high school in 2000. I recently drove up by the place this summer. It looked like it was being completely gutted or prepped for demolition. I have half a mind to pull up there and try to contact the new owners to see if maybe they experienced anything similar while they were there. If that place is even still intact next time when I'm in the area. When I was a kid, I had various encounters that led me to the conclusion that there might be an afterlife. I don't mean when I was like a little kid, but throughout my youth and teenage years, some small interactions told me that they were ghosts or an afterlife of some kind. After I got into high school though, nothing happened to me for a long time, and like clockwork, I kind of forgot that I ever believed in that stuff at all. Flash forward to my first time away from home, and I encountered something that sent me into flashbacks and made me remember all the crazy stuff from when I was a kid. What follows comes from my second semester in college. I went to school in upstate New York, like way upstate, where you discover a new level of cold. A few roommates and I lived in this creepy rundown apartment that we all swore was haunted. The place was dingy, dark, even if it was daylight outside. Even with the windows open, nothing could bring light in. It made no sense. Now I guess we know the truth. Before we go any further, I want to say for the record that I definitely asked for it. The city where I lived is known for horrible weather, which kept me inside most of the time. And of course, ghost stories, among other things. Since I'd always been interested in the myths and the legends, I spent a lot of that time on the weird part of YouTube, eventually landing on some pages about ghosts, spirits, and how to invite them to communicate with you. To be clear, I never used a Ouija board or anything like that because hell no. But a few days prior to this event, I've been reading and watching stuff on calling out to spirits by saying things like, if anyone's there, make yourself known, or cool things like, if someone's here, I invite you to share my company. I'd also recently been introduced to the concept of a succubus, which is important for this story. As another important note, the layout of my bedroom was pretty wonky. But all that really matters is that my closet was really big and went all the way into the exposed attic which made my room pretty cold most of the time. I couldn't see into the attic part because it was at a weird angle, but I always got this really creepy vibe being inside my closet, so I never even tried. Most importantly of all, my closet didn't have a door, so if I sat up in bed, all I would see across my room was this black formless void through the closet doorway. I always thought that was super creepy, but I was still pretty fascinated with weird things at this point in my life and my room was partially illuminated by a nearby streetlight outside. So at times, I didn't mind gazing into the empty black abyss of my open closet door every night. Fun, right? Aside from all that, Buffalo isn't that nice of a place. There had been break-ins around the neighborhood, so I brought this big hammer that I kept on a hook behind my door. If anything ever went down, I could easily grab it with a quick lunge, and it made me feel halfway safe. Keep in mind that all this happened after many nights of me quote unquote inviting things to my bedside to no avail. This incident happened on Halloween night, ironically, and I spent a large part of that evening drinking my face off with friends at a party. I blacked out at some point, so I wasn't even sure what time it was when I got home. My drunk ass randomly wakes up in my bed, facing the wall. I'm just getting my bearings, when I suddenly feel the girl that I brought home big spooning me cuddling me close with one of her arms wrapped around me. 
I hear her yawn and let out this quiet giggle before she starts playfully twirling my hair and sensually drawing lines down my rib cage around my back with her fingernails. Stepping out of my drunken stupor, I realized I couldn't remember who I brought home from the party. To me, this was kind of hilarious. I was desperately trying not to laugh. I was popular with some sorority girls at the time. I thought it'd be funny surprise to find out who'd come home with me. But then it clicked. I didn't bring anyone home. I'd stumbled home alone, but I could still feel the hands on my back, someone's legs wrapping around mine, warm breath on my neck. And at that point, I freaked the fuck out. Suddenly the legs gripped tightly around mine, the way a python snares around its prey. Fingernails clawed into my back and wrenched my hair out of my scalp. Whoever or whatever was in my bed was going ballistic, attacking me like some kind of wild animal. I was so terrified that I was completely paralyzed, too afraid to turn around. I didn't know what to do, so I just started praying, praying that God would help me. After a few moments, the pain was so great that I finally sprung up. I scrambled out of bed, grabbed that hammer and flicked on the light. There was no one there. I just stood there in pure awe, holding the hammer and freaking the hell out. I went to the bathroom, got some water and then went back to bed with the lights on. Somehow, I eventually fell back asleep. In the morning, I got up and took a piss. I figured it was all a bad dream, until I got back into my room and saw the hammer sitting on my bedside table. From then on, I never tried to invite anything into my home. The problem is, some doors don't close that easily once you open them up. And as I said, that creepy closet didn't have one.